chief alternative for personal hygiene. Pangarap kong magkaroon ng mabilis at murang transportasyon para sa lahat. Pangarap kong masagot ang malnutrition. Pangarap ko pong magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergency. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko pong maging scientist. Ayun na simulan na Humanda sabay-sabay akyat Hawak kamay tayo yang atilipad Lipad Aking nabuti ng pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan ng aghag Ang kaong naran ay makagamtan Kung lahat magtutulong na Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of our Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines, or the VA program webinar series. I am Jovin Barcelo from the Environment and Biotechnology Division of BOST ITDI, and I will be your host for today. So this two-day webinar is part of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines, or the VIP's information and education campaign on virology and other related topics. So this learning session is made possible by the collaborative efforts of the DOST Central Office, DOST ITDI, DOST PCHRD, DOST Picard, and the DOST Balik Scientist Program. So sure po ako, no, excited na po yung lahat ng participants natin today to learn about uh, our new topic for today. So before po that, um, reminder lang po sa ating mga Zoom participants for today, kindly rename your Zoom account. Uh, the format that was given by our um, chat moderators po. So, nasa chat box na po natin ito. Ano? So, ilagay po natin yung ating affiliation, underscore uh, full name, and then wag po ating kalimutan na mag-mute ng ating microphones to avoid interruptions during the presentation proper. So, now for this two-day webinar, we shall be learning a lot about the guidelines for research involving recombinant and synthetic nucleic acids which will be uh, discussed by our resource speaker for today, Dr. Elpidio Cesar B. Nadala Jr., a balik scientist from the diagnostics for the real world in United States. So bago po tayo mag-start, so I'll be checking po muna kung ilan na yung participants natin sa ating Zoom meeting room, uh, maging din sa ating uh, Facebook and YouTube live streams. So currently po, dito sa ating Zoom meeting room, meron tayong 150 participants and then nadadagdagan pa po siya. Uh, naman po dun sa ating um, Facebook stream, we have currently 37 um, attendees or participants. And then dito naman po sa ating um, YouTube live stream, so meron po tayong 23 um, participants sa ngayon. Okay, so and po, so tumataas na po yung ating participants sa ating Zoom meeting room currently. So bago po tayo mag-start, ano? so um, i-check ko lang din po yung mga participants natin today kung sino po ba sa kanila yung nakasali din dun sa ating uh, first webinar last week. So uh, thumbs up react lang po no, dun sa ating mga participants today na nakasama din po doon sa ating uh, first webinar. So syempre magka-thumbs up react ako kasi yan, kasama rin po ako doon sa participants last week. 
So, thumbs up react lang po. So, i-check ko po dito sa ating uh, participants list. Yan, kung sino-sino. Yan, so marami pong nag, uh, ano, thumbs up. Yan, me po. Yan. So, ayan. So, mukhang marami pa rin po sa atin, ano, yung uh, nakapag-participate po dun last week and then continually participating din sa ating webinar today. So, maraming salamat po sa inyong continued support sa ating ma webinar series. So, sana po magtuloy-tuloy po yan ano, hanggang sa end po ng ating uh, VIP program webinar series. Para naman po doon sa mga participants natin that were not able to join us during uh, the webinar last week. So, medyo magbibigay lang po ako ng recap tungkol po doon sa naging discussion natin ano, doon sa ating first webinar. So, last week, we had Dr. Myra Hosmilio, our balik scientist from the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. So she discussed the bioethics on the use of animals in research and proper animal handling. So for me, yung mga key takeaways ko no, dun sa ating um, webinar last week, sa ating two-day webinar last week is uh, first and foremost is yung three R's yan, of animal research, which is yung reduction, replacement, and refinement. So me being an engineer, actually iba rin yung concept ko ng three R, di ba? Lalo na heavily involved po ako sa waste management. So, syempre, meron tayong 3R din, di ba, sa, ano, sa pasuran. So, meron tayong reduce, reuse, recycle. Pero pagdating pala sa field of study ng animal research, meron din silang sariling 3Rs, which is yung reduction, replacement, and, and uh, refinement. So, yung reduction, so as the name implies, so um, it is the uh, reducing the number of our uh, subject animals or sample animals for our research. So, kailangan yung dami niya as uh, minimum as possible lang. So, as uh, discussed by Dr. Hosmilio last week. So the second R is yung ating uh, replacement. So as the name also implies, so papalitan natin yung ating subject animals. So for example, from uh, vertebrates, pwede tayong gumamit ng invertebrate subjects naman like insects. Replacement. And lastly, for refinement naman, so this uh, involves yung um, changes doon sa ating process or procedures sa ating experimental met uh, methodology para bawasan yung stress or yung suffering ng ating subject animals. Ayan. So, uh, for the second day naman, so ito naman yung key takeaway ko for the second day. So, another one is yung uh, effects naman ng animal handling on the uh, behavior and response of the subject animals towards our experiments. So, ang naging example nga dito ni Dr. Smilio last week is yung handling natin ng ating um, mice, di ba? So, uh, meron tayong uh, two types ng handling na suggested nga. Ano? So, meron tayong copying tsaka tunnel holding. So, malaking effect pala at yung handling natin ng ating animals sa magiging response nila or behavior towards our experiment. Para po doon sa mga participants natin na hindi po nakasali doon sa ating webinar last week, so sayang po, ano? Pero wag po tayong malungkot kasi meron pa rin po tayong chance to learn about bioethics and animal handling because we'll have another webinar about the topic soon. Kaya po, like and follow lang po doon sa aming environment and biotechnology division ITDI Facebook page for announcements regarding this and our future webinars for this series. So, ayan po. Um, check po ulit tayo ng ating participants. So, ayan. So, meron na po tayong 182 participants sa ating Zoom meeting room. And then, meron na po tayong 26 na taga-subaybay sa ating YouTube live stream and dito naman po sa ating Facebook meron na tayong 47 na um, audience. Ayan. Um, so, bago po tayo mag-start uh, formally for our today's webinar, let us share first a couple of uh, video presentations to give our participants an introduction to the VIP program as well as the Balik Scientist program. So, uh, please roll the clip po. Thank you very much. We are now living in a new normal. This COVID-19 pandemic marks as one of the global challenges experienced because... in this generation. It forces every sector of our society to innovate in order to move forward. We at the Industrial Technology Development Institute of the Department of Science and Technology is trying every possible ways to continue our service to our people without compromising the safety of each and everyone.
recognizing the critical role of science and technology in economic development and progress. The Balik Scientist Act or Republic Act 11035 was signed into law last June 2018 by President Rodrigo Roa Duterte. This is actually uh, putting into law a program that uh, has been started by the Department of Science and Technology almost uh, 40 years ago. Uh, but uh, we need uh, some uh, legal support so that we can implement it in a uh, better way. The Malik scientists will have an uh, easier time in terms of uh, coming here to the Philippines and rendering services. Who is the Balik scientist? experience and expertise of uh, uh, Filipinos uh, who have made good uh, practice of uh, being scientists abroad so that we can uh, they can share whatever they have uh, in terms of knowledge uh, and wisdom to uh, our own institutions, uh, our own uh, researchers. My role and responsibility of a public scientist is to be not just a teacher or a facilitator but also a pusher innovations within the program. Balik scientists are given support by the government for their stay in the country and are likewise provided with a wide array of benefits to ensure their maximum output. The best incentives or privileges or benefits are having to be exposed with our farmers. My greatest privilege would be uh, doing collaborative work with uh, fellow Filipinos. The DOST, as the leading agency in charge of the Balik Scientist Program, is tasked to facilitate the placement of the Balik Scientist among its priority areas from its sub-agencies. P-Card PCHRD P-Shared Partnering with the DOST are the host institutions, private or public entities, providing the appropriate resources to the Balik scientist in the completion of their research activities and other tasks. I think the role of the institution is to give the space or the laboratory needed for the program or the project. Working together, the DOST, the Balik scientists, and the host institutions have proven the importance of collaboration and cooperation, critical of any nation's vision for success. I am an advocate of Balik Scientist Program. Okay, being one, I really truly felt that uh, Balik Scientists would be able to help in uplifting the economic growth of, of, of the country. My hopes is to really contribute to uh, the space agency. It's a very, very pragmatic and uh, we will need everybody's help and also promulgate the STEM program here in the Philippines. We really need to encourage other Balik scientists or other scientists abroad to uh, give their time. They need to give back and uh, help the country. With the enactment of the Balik Scientist Act, the country is looking towards a stronger and more solid Science and Technology Foundation, propelling the nation to further heights. Change has come indeed for science and technology. Science for change. Science for the people. And so that was our uh, prepared AVP for the VIP program and for the Balik Scientist program. So again, let's check in po muna kung ilan na po yung ating uh, participants present in our Zoom meeting room. So meron po tayong 198 in our Zoom meeting room sa ating Facebook page po or Facebook live stream rather. So meron po tayong 44 
and then sa ating um, YouTube live stream, meron po tayong 26 currently watching the live stream. Okay. So, uh, to formally welcome our distinguished speaker and uh, dear participants, may I please call on Dr. Annabel Vibriones, Director of the Industrial Technology Development Institute or DOSD ITDI. Dr. Briones. Uh, Dr. Annabel, nakamute po ata kayo man. Okay, nakamute. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, uh, a pleasant uh, morning to everyone. Uh, our honored speaker, uh, Balik Scientist, Dr. Elpidio Cesar Binadala, my IPDI family, DOST officials, colleagues, participants, guests, I promise greetings to all of you. Last week, we have our first uh, successful uh, webinar on bioethics uh, regarding the use of animals for uh, research, uh, proper animal handling. So it was a very uh, successful one. I think with more than uh, 300 participants attending the event and we have a very uh, lively discussion uh, in the two days uh, webinar. So today is the second uh, series uh, the project uh, at the webinar of, under the project on establishment uh, on the virology and vaccine institute of the Philippines, we commonly called it as uh, VIP for short. So uh, to brief you all again, the VIP project of DOST was conceptualized to address the public readiness of the country. So the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic uh, presents many concerns, particularly effective uh, clinical and public health management, primarily on novel uh, viruses. And these uh, concerns and issues can only be addressed uh, using science and technology, specifically through research and development. So does the DOP through the leadership of the, our dearest the Secretary for Tanato de la Peña, finds a solution to this global concern by establishing virology and vaccine research institute with the prime goal of developing diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics. So the objectives of the VIP are, uh, number one, serve as the premier research and development institute in the field of virology encompassing all areas in viruses and viral diseases in humans, plants, and animals. Second, act as a venue for scientists, both here and abroad, to work collaboratively to study viruses of agricultural, industrial, clinical, and environmental importance. And the third, uh, establish strat strategic partnership with the world's leading scientists virology centers and institutes and conduct innovative and pioneering research that will advance the frontiers of virology in the country. So institutionalize the VIP and get the support from our lawmakers in Congress and Senate by passing the bill regarding the establishment of the VIP. So while we are still waiting for the enact uh, enactment of the uh, VIP bill into a law, the DOST has initiated uh, several R&D projects that is being implemented by ITBI, St. Luke's Medical Center, and the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. So these projects are being implemented in partnerships with several local and international researchers and institutions. So with these initial projects, we hope to build the capacity of the VIP and help resolve some of the pressing issues in the country brought about by the viruses. So part of the project's activities is engaging the expertise of the Balik scientists to help us accomplish these uh, initiatives. So we have seven Balik scientists 
uh, two from United Kingdom, four from the United States, and one from Australia. So among the activities of the Balik Scientists is the conduct of seminar, lectures, and forums. Today, Dr. Cesar Nadala will discuss the guidelines for research involving recombinant and synthetic nucleic acid molecules. I welcome all the participants in the webinar series and I am delighted to have you among us in this activity. Uh, allow me to express my gratitude to Dr. Nadala for accepting the BSP engagement in the ITBI in the VIP program. My special thanks also to the VIP team of ITBI, the Technological Services Division, and the Planning and uh, Management Information System Division for organizing this event. The BSP Secretariat of SKHRD and PCARD, our ever supportive Secretary for Tanakuti de la Peña, Undersecretary Rowena Cristina Guevara, Director uh, Jaime Montoya, and Director Rinaldo Tibora. I encourage the participants to actively join in the QA portion. I hope you will learn a lot from this webinar. And I also look ahead to seeing some of you working at the VIP facility once established at New Clark City in Carlos Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bionis, for your uh, warm welcoming remarks for our esteemed guest speaker and our participants. So now, to formally introduce our distinguished black scientist and resource speaker for this morning, so, Dr. Elpidio Cesar B. Nadala Jr. obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in biology and microbiology at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. After taking his master's in microbiology, doctorate in microbiology and animal virology, and postdoctorate in aquatic virology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Honolulu. He pursued postdoctorate in medical biotechnology at the National University of Singapore, then another postdoctorate in aquatic virology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and finally a postdoctorate in medical biotechnology at the University of Cambridge in Cambridge, United Kingdom. Dr. Nadala is a virologist and microbiologist with 20 years of experience in academic research and 17 years in the industry developing diagnostic assays for the detection of bacterial and viral pathogens. He co-founded the Diagnostics for the Real World Limited, DRW, in 2003 where he led the development of rapid diagnostic tests for the detection of hepatitis B virus or HBV, surface antigen human immunodeficiency virus or HIV, antibodies and hepatitis C virus or HC antibodies, as well as improvements of the CE mark chlamydia rapid test. So from 2008 to 2018, um, he worked in the food and environmental testing industry, where he led a group of 17 PhD scientists and technicians in research and development to develop and produce cutting edge diagnostic skills, uh, diagnostic kits rather, and reagents such as uh, PCR or qPCR reagents and immunodiagnostic assays to detect pathogens, parasites, toxins, GMO, antibiotics, allergens, and other adulterants in food and water. He then came back to the RW as Vice President of Research and Development in late 2018 the initial task of improving the manufacturing and quality control testing of the point of care Samba 2 HIV test kits, which were already being issued in Africa. Later, he developed the Samba 2 HBV assay. In February 2020, his team started the development of the Samba 2 SARS CoV 2 test for detection of SARS CoV 2 RNA, which was developed and validated within two months. The Samba 2 SARS CoV 2 test is now being used in 79 hospitals and schools in the United Kingdom. With a total of 648 assay modules deployed and 300,000 tests used so far. Dr. Nadala's statement is to utilize the knowledge and experience he has acquired throughout his career in helping field scientists and engineers who are working in the field of virology as well as in diagnostics. Let's give a warm welcome and a big virtual round of applause to Dr. Elpidio Cesar Binadala Jr.
Dr. Nadala, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, uh, I have the, oh, let me see, make sure I share the right screen. Are you seeing my title page? I'm not yet, uh, sir. Okay. Hmm. And we can see it now, sir. Thank you. Okay, good. So um, let's see. How do I minimize this? I need to see my own screen. Okay, looks good. Uh, So uh, I just just an update on the introduction. Thank you very much for that, uh, Joven. Um, the uh, the SARS-CoV-2 assay in the UK that we're supplying over there is now more than a million that we have shipped, and we are preparing to ship two million more. So it's that needed over there. Um, in more than 100 hospitals by now. So uh, my talk for today is uh, the aim of this uh, webinar is to share my experiences with recombinant and synthetic nucleotides as I carried out my research and development activities on diagnostic assays for viruses. Uh, as you heard, my background is virology and immunology. Actually, when I was doing my PhD, um, I had immunology as well. Uh, but I have been using molecular biology techniques in most of my work. So I will split this webinar into two parts. Uh, so the first part today will be on antisense oligonucleotides uh, and then antigens and in vitro transcripts. Uh, the second part uh, scheduled for tomorrow will be on DNA targets, armored RNA, and uh, the assay development we did for SARS-CoV-2 and which, uh, which nucleotides I had to synthesize for that. So at the end of the, these webinars, I hope that some of you pick up ideas that you can apply to your own research. Um, I realized that due to the limited time, I will not be able to provide a lot of details, but I'm happy to correspond with you uh, outside the webinars. So, uh, why use recombinant or synthetic nucleic acids? Well, when we're working with biological agents, uh, laboratory facilities must have risk control measures in place uh, for the work to be safely conducted. And two important considerations are biosafety and biosecurity. Biosafety meaning you avoid uh, inadvertent release or exposure to a biological agent that you're working on. And biosecurity meaning we need to prevent the misuse of these biological agents as a weapon for harm, uh, like in bioterrorism. So by using the technology of recombinant or synthetic nucleic acid molecules, instead of propagating high titer infectious biological agents, both biosafety and biosecurity risks can be minimized or eliminated. I expect that many of you, well, the audience today is diverse, uh, 
probably ranging from students to fellow scientists, as well as those working in government and private industry. So I will start with some basic facts about nucleic acid structure and uh, later talk about the central dogma of molecular, microbi uh, molecular biology uh, before sharing my experiences with recombinant in synthetic nucleotides. Uh, because when we talk about viruses, when we talk about uh, nucleotides, this is really what we're talking about. Uh, so the, the structure, as many of you know, is a double helix uh, composed of these nitrogenous bases, ionic timing, guanine, and cytosine base pair. Uh, and so uh, there's base pairing, which is A, T, and thymine, and one to sustain. Uh, and the actual structure, chemical structure, is to write. And you have these uh, two systems of DNA direction, but pair uh, uh, together. But I see to take note of which will become significant in the next slide. Base, you have which in the case of the ribose, in the case of RNA, it's called ribose. But you also have phosphate, and actually, phosphate, the phosphate group, is the one that links the uh, bases in the strand, in the single strand of DNA, okay? Uh, just remember that because there's going to be a change in this structure in some of the uh, antisense oligos that I'll be talking about. Besides that, so you have DNA, but uh, actually the flow of genetic information, uh, we do know that most of uh, living things uh, have DNA for their genome, which codes basically for uh, recording stopped. How to make? Yeah, am I still going? Okay, I'll just continue uh, until you stop me. Uh, so the uh, the uh, genetic information flows from DNA uh, and making RNA copies, and then from RNA making proteins by a translation of the sequence of these bases into amino acids that make up the protein. And then, of course, the proteins are enzymes and uh, structural proteins, everything that make up uh, a biological system. Okay, so keep on remembering that you have DNA to RNA to protein. Of course, there's reverse transcription you've heard a lot about, uh, which is basically if you have an RNA virus like SARS-CoV-2, you have to convert to DNA first before you can do polymerase chain reaction. But there are other ways to amplify the genome of SARS-CoV-2 without reverse transcription. Uh, that's- uh, Recording in progress. Okay, good. I'm back. Uh, so, so that's that's the basics. Okay, this is the, what they call the central dogma of molecular biology: uh, that the flow of genetic information comes from DNA to RNA and from RNA to protein. Now, uh, if you look at the different viruses in the Baltimore classification of viruses. Uh, actually, they're made up, or their genome is made of different versions of nucleic acids. You have double-stranded DNA, like in smallpox. You have single-stranded DNA, like in uh, human papilloma virus. Uh, and then you have double-stranded DNA, like in rotaviruses. Uh, and a positive strand, single-stranded RNA. There's a positive and a negative strand RNA because the positive strand can directly code for proteins, whereas the negative strand is a negative sense and therefore it has to be converted first to a positive strand. And then you have also positive strand 
uh, RNA in the case of HIV and uh, another double strand uh, DNA for hepatitis B. But it goes through uh, different processing from the rest of the double stranded. So there's the viruses are diverse and uh, they have different types of genome. That's all the point I wanted to make. So I started working with recombinant and synthetic nucleotides almost 30 years ago at IMCB, uh, at the National University of Singapore. Uh, the Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology was officially opened in October 1987 at the National University uh, to develop and support the biomedical R&D capabilities in Singapore. And it has subsequently be, uh, become autonomous uh, research institute of the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, they call ASTAR uh, in 2004. In this uh, institute, I work with in Dr. Robert Ting's lab, along with Teresa Tan, who is now a faculty of NUS. Uh, and so the project, this was back in 1992. Uh, the project we were working on was Epstein-Barr virus and uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Epstein-Barr virus is a human herpes virus uh, that infects most individuals and can cause an infectious mononucleosis syndrome when infecting adolescents. Uh, Epstein-Barr is etiologically associated with numerous malignancies, including endemic Burkitt's lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and certain forms of B-cell lymphoma. So, uh, the uh, Singapore, Singaporeans were really interested in nasopharyngeal carcinoma because they have high incidence of this uh, cancer, as well as in uh, south, southern China uh, areas. Uh, so our task was to develop early detection of uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma uh, by looking for antigens from Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, the other task is to develop a treatment using antisense phosphorothioate oligos. So this is now, uh, you're looking at what a phosphorothioate oligo is or what it's composed of. Uh, so you have the base here, they didn't show the actual uh, chemical structure, but this is the, 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 the sugar uh, the deoxyribose, uh, ribo, uh, and this is the phosphate group. Instead of oxygen in this position, they replaced it with uh, sulfur, and that's why it's called phosphorothioate. And the reason for that is when you replace that oxygen with sulfur, they are easy to synthesize, highly water soluble, which is important when you use it as a therapeutic, and resistant against nucleolytic degradation. So nucleases that you might find in serum or in your blood uh, will not be able to degrade it. Therefore, uh, the therapeutic effect will last. So the first project was the uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or ELISA for early detection of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Back in 1992, uh, there were already some sequencing uh, that have been done with uh, viruses. And uh, so I looked at the Epstein-Barr virus genome and what sequences were there and chose different proteins that are to be expressed or are being expressed by the virus supposedly. Uh, and test them. So in that, I had to clone the protein uh, and then uh, clone by uh, PCR cloning. So you would PCR it, amplify it, and then get that fragment and insert it into a vector and then uh, check by sequencing that the sequence is correct. 
And uh, back then, the sequencers uh, that we were using were uh, the Sanger sequencing method, the manual one where you use uh, based on dideoxynucleotides uh, and uh, by P33 labeling. So that's radioactive labeling. And then you have this long gel where you basically determine ATGC. Uh, nowadays, of course, we have next generation sequencing uh, methods uh, can be done in large scale. Uh, for example, using uh, Illuminous technology, uh, although the Sanger sequencing method is still uh, in use. Of course, after confirming the sequence, the, uh, this fragment is, in, uh, is again inserted in an expression vector and at the time I used uh, maltose binding protein as a tag, because when you purify it, you have to tag it and then purify it in a column uh, separated from the rest of the bacterial lysate. So I chose uh, one gene from Epstein-Barr virus uh, called BMRF1. It just means BAMH1 fragment medium uh, reading frame one. Uh, BAMH1 is uh, one of those restriction enzymes that molecular biologists use to cut up DNA. So this particular gene is an early lytic Epstein-Barr virus protein that functions as both viral DNA polymerase processivity factor and as a transcriptional activator for some uh, virus promoters. In addition, and interestingly enough, and BMRF1 can modulate some cellular processes, including the DNA damage response to double strand breaks, which has some implication on mutations that can lead to uh, cancer. Okay, so I got the protein, I expressed it, I purified it, and then I set up the assay, the ELISA assay format that I use to detect uh, the virus and use it as a prediction for presence of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. By the way, nasopharyngeal carcinoma uh, is diff difficult to detect because it's in your nasopharynx. And as you know, your nasal passages are not easy to see. So something might already, a tumor might be growing in there. And until it's big enough, to obstruct your breathing, uh, you don't know it's there. And when you find out it's there, it's too late. It's too big already. And it may have already spread out and you're already in stage three or something. And that's normally the case. And that's why they were desperate to find an assay that could predict or at least tell at the early stages that they have uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So the format I used is indirect ELISA. Uh, so basically the viral antigen is coated in the well of a plate, an ELISA plate. And then uh, the sample is added. So this would be the antibody we're looking for. Mm -hmm. We're looking for antibodies in the patient's uh, saliva in this case or serum uh, because if they were exposed to Epstein-Barr virus, they would have developed antibodies. If they have nasopharyngeal carcinoma that has, the, uh, caused by, has been caused by the virus, uh, they should have antibodies uh, to the Epstein-Barr virus. And so, uh, and these antibodies should be more or less uh, more specific towards nasopharyngeal carcinoma than to Epstein-Barr. And then... Uh, uh, then we add the detector antibody, uh, which is this green antibody over here, uh, which is labeled with an enzyme, uh, horseradish peroxidase or HRP in this case, and you add a substrate. So if, if the patient's serum or saliva has antibodies, in this case IgA, uh, against uh, Epstein-Barr virus, then you will have a positive result. So uh, the work that uh, resulted from this uh, 
was published uh, in the Journal of Medical Virology in 1996, well, 25 years ago. Uh, the BMRF1 protein, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, an accessory, uh, a DNA polymerase accessory protein. Uh, and hello. Eleven. Eleven. Oh, my pasmata is in money. Mm -hmm. uh, shall I continue? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Po. Continue. Okay. All right. An enzyme. Uh, so the enzyme linked immunoassay was developed and uh, for detection of IgA. IgA. IgA, by the way, is uh, a type of antibody. Uh, normally, you're more familiar with IgM, the early antibody, IgG, the one in your the memory. Uh, antibody that stays longer. IgA is a secretory antibody uh, and it's normally secreted with the saliva, but you can also find it in the serum. Uh, and uh, the assay was shown to be specific for nasopharyngeal carcinoma patients. Uh, and when used with saliva alone, uh, it has a sensitivity comparable to uh, indirect immunoperoxidase assay for early antigens, the ones that are already being used. Uh, the sensitivity of the assay was significantly enhanced to 86% and, uh, by use of paired saliva and serum samples. So that's the first project. Second project uh, was the antisense oligos as a therapeutic for uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, the one type of antisense oligo uh, is phosphorothioate, which where the S is changed. But there are other types they call lock nucleic acids, uh, O-methyl RNA, and uh, phosphoramidates. Uh, but this is the one we use. And there are several mechanisms by which antisense oligos work. And uh, primarily, the uh, antisense oligo is single-stranded. It's, it's normally DNA, but it could be RNA. And it's used to target a specific sense nucleotide, uh, mRNA, specific sense mRNA. And these mRNA are involved in... Uh, some type of uh, pathological state because of some proteins being overexpressed or some uh, protein needed by the virus. Uh, so they can be very effective uh, tools, not only for basic molecular biology or genomics or pro proteomics research, but also for drug discovery like in what we tried to do here. Uh, so the way it works is, for example, uh, if I apply antisense oligo against uh, this mRNA here, and uh, my antisense oligo, of course, has to be specific to this mRNA uh, that I'm targeting. Once they are bound together, an enzyme called RNase H will come in and cut this mRNA. And the reason for that is RNase H functions to cut, cut up RNA that's bound to DNA. Uh, that's its only function. Uh, so if you have a hybrid DNA strand that is complementary to an RNA strand, the RNase H comes in and cuts the RNA up. That's how it works. So how did I experiment with antisense oligos? Uh, so that I can tell whether it's working against nasopharyngeal carcinoma or not. Well, I chose uh, a nasopharyngeal carcinoma cell line called SUNE-1. And I injected it subcutaneously into what are called xenograft uh, uh, as a xenograft in nude mice. Nude mice, uh, not because, well, nude mice, because they're hairless, 
but uh, because they're all, because they're also uh, seed mice, they call it severe combined immunodeficiency mice. Essentially, these mice have no immune defense, so they don't have antibody mediated, don't have cell mediated. So if I introduce a uh, cell line, a uh, a uh, cancer cell line like nasopharyngeal carcinoma under the skin, they won't be able to reject that. There won't be any inflammation. So the carcinoma is free to grow uh, like it would in your body, for example, if uh, you had cancer. So uh, after injecting it, I would uh, follow that up with uh, different injections uh, with just phosphate buffered saline, uh, with a carrier called DOTAP or uh, my antisense oligos. In this case, I use uh, one type B40 and another type B49 in two different doses, uh, 10 and uh, 100 micrograms. And I noticed a significant reduction in tumor size, especially for the B49 uh, antisense oligo versus uh, the controls here and the other type of oligo, which has some effect, but not quite as good as B49. So uh, our work in antisense oligos and their therapeutic applications was published also back then in 1994. And uh, I left IMCB, uh, went back to Hawaii, but I, I, uh, if I look back, I noticed that out of the uh, antisense oligos actually uh, became approved medicines for some conditions, notably for uh, cytomegalovirus, which is a close relative of Epstein-Barr. They're both herpes viruses. Uh, cytomegalovirus, the, this first one here, uh, is a serious viral infection of the uh, causes a serious viral infection of the retina of your eye. Uh, so that's the uh, light sensing nerve layer uh, at the back of your eye. Uh, so apparently uh, a company was able to uh, use a phosphorothioate DNA oligo just like ours against this virus. Uh, and the mode of operation, as you can see, is via RNAs H. Okay, so 10 years later, uh, I co-founded a company, uh, DRW, and uh, uh, along with four other scientists from the University of Cambridge. And we had investments from the Wellcome Trust uh, the company was started in the Bay Area in order to have access to product development funding provided by the Small Business Innovation Research Grants of the National Institutes of Health uh, in uh, uh, U.S. government. Uh, the goal of the of DRW was to serve the diagnostic needs of resource poor settings. Uh, the underpinning principle is that tests for developing countries must be of the same quality as those of developed countries. So our first task was to develop rapid tests for HIV and HCV, both very common in Africa among the uh, blood transfusion uh, centers. So. Imagine if they don't test the blood in their uh, blood centers, they would spread infection of these viruses. Now, we know that uh, when uh, dealing or testing HIV or HCV samples, uh, we can do biological safety level two, but to propagate them, you need 
uh, biological safety level three. So uh, what are those? Uh, let me just quickly get you through, although I think in two weeks I'll be giving another seminar on this, uh, but uh, just to describe to you what biological safety level two means. Uh, a biological safety level two facility has a controlled access door uh, over here. Uh, you have a hand washing station. You have sharps and hazards bin. Uh, physical containment device, which is this, which is a biological safety cabinet, uh, class two. Uh, there are different classes. And then of course you have your PPE, uh, your bench, and an autoclave. These are all required. Uh, so I wanted to work in this kind of facility because our facility was biological safety level two. If I needed to grow and propagate HIV, then I would need a biological safety level three. And in, in this level three, you have double doors uh, and controlled access, of course, and as an option or an enhancement, you probably you, you could have a shower over there uh, installed, but it's not an absolute requirement. And then of course you have your uh, the same ones like you have in uh, biological safety level two, but again, uh, a powered air purifying respirator is an enhancement as well uh, to increase or to decrease the risk of uh, contamination. Uh, and there is a, a physical containment device, just like the uh, safety level two. And of course, as an enhancement, uh, the whole facility is airtight, okay? This is airtight and uh, the exhaust from that is filtered by a HIPAA filter and all effluents that come out from the sink are treated uh, before they're put out into the uh, sewage. So anyway, uh, that's the uh, level three uh, facility. So in, in Cambridge, we did have it and we did grow and propagate HIV over there initially. Uh, at the time, we weren't using any uh, synthetic uh, uh, nucleotides as target. We were actually using HIV. Uh, and this is my wife here working on HIV. Uh, so in, the, in developing the assay, this is again uh, an antibody assay similar to uh, earlier. Uh, so I have to basically uh, Hold on. I'm not, okay. Uh, I have to select targets, uh, just like I did with Epstein Barr. This time, the target has to be uh, a part of the virus that can elicit uh, antibody or that the uh, patients would produce antibody against. That's number one. Number two, that it's a, the epitope, epitopes, most of the epitopes in what I choose have to be conserved, meaning it's not gonna keep changing. Uh, HIV is known to be hyper viable. Uh, it changes a lot. And that's why up to now there is no vaccine for HIV. Uh, and uh, the same for HCB, of course, but for HIV, what I end up choosing is uh, GP41. GP41 is this, uh, this uh, transmembrane uh, part of GP160. Uh, but uh, the, G, the, the GP160 meaning 160 kilo daltons in size, uh, basically. So the 120 kilo dalton part of that envelope protein of HIV uh, is glycosylated heavily and very variable. So 
if I choose that, I might not be able to detect some uh, antibodies from some patients. Uh, so I chose GP41. And GP36 is the HID2 counterpart of GP41. Now to clone, to clone these, uh, this is now early 2000, 2003, 2004. So we have available uh, the PET cloning expression system. Uh, the PET expression system provides the highest level of protein expression. Uh, so, and it utilizes two levels of uh, regulation uh, to provide uh, the tightest control of basal expression and uh, to achieve, uh, and it achieves this via the lack operator sites in two different promoters. Uh, so let me show you what that is. So the PET plasmid is here, okay? And you insert the gene you want to express in this part here inside a uh, multiple cloning site where you have several, uh, several restriction enzyme sites. So, but uh, the thing with the, with the PET plasmid is uh, if you introduce it in bacteria that has this uh, DE3 modification, uh, here, uh, the expression of the uh, gene, which is controlled by uh, a LAC promoter uh, or a LAC operator uh, and uh, transcribed by T7 RNA polymerase uh, is very strong. This induction by IPTG. IPTG, the, uh, normally uh, you have the LAC repressor sitting here. Oops, hold on. The LAC repressor sits here and prevents the T7, T7 RNA polymerase from transcribing your gene. Uh, but once you induce that with IPTG, uh, the T7 polymerase binds and then starts transcribing your gene. But T7 polymerase is also under the control of the LAC repressor on the genome of the host bacteria, in this case, E. coli. Uh, so you have two control points. And in the absence of IPTG, the LAC repressor controls expression of the T7 gene and controls expression of your gene. So only when you have IPTG will both of these be activated and produce your protein. This is very important uh, because you don't want background uh, induction. So basal levels should be really low uh, in case your protein is toxic, for example. So you want that control. Uh, the one here in the middle just has to do with lysozyme. Uh, sometimes you want uh, uh, lysozyme production as well, uh, a separate gene. Uh, for that in the bacteria uh, so that uh, your bacterial host can easily lyse without you know, harsh treatment, only, uh, only treat it with uh, detergent, for example. Okay, so uh, using the PET system, I expressed the HIV genes uh, in this case, for example, uh, this, uh, this lanes nine and 10 here, those are the fusion protein from um, HIV2, uh, uh, the GP36. And then this is the GP31 proteins expressed. They're relatively clean, around more than 90% pure. And I've also fused uh, I've also, by the way, uh, amplified the uh, P32. P32 is the capsid protein for uh, HIV, which is here. It's 32 kilodalton, so it's a lot bigger than uh, 
a lot bigger than these ones were just a smaller part of GP41 and 36. And I fused all three of them into this bigger one in case I want all of them present in one antigen. So for HBV, uh, HCV, sorry, I chose uh, the core protein found here uh, that's associated with the uh, with the uh, RNA of the virus, the genome of the virus, and a non-structural uh, protein called NS3, which is actually a protease helicase and assembly factor. So it's cut up into uh, an en uh, two enzymes and one factor. And that's the reason why it's also conserved because it's, it needs uh, the functional domain to be uh, conserved. So again, I, I just purify it very easy. Uh, by the way, uh, my tag here is histidine, uh, very convenient uh, tag for expression because you can use a nickel column to uh, purify the protein. And so, of course, uh, the format, but uh, this time it's not ELISA, uh, it's a rapid antigen test, so it's a test strip type format, like you'd see in... Uh, in, oh, I missed that, uh, the rooster crow. Anyway, uh, so rapid antigen test format uh, where in the test line, I would apply the antigen, of course, the HIV antigen, whether it's GP41 um, or the HCV uh, NS3 uh, antigen. And uh, when you apply the patient's blood or serum in the sample pad, uh, it goes into the probe pad or the detector antibody pad. The, normally these probes are uh, gold particles labeled with an antibody uh, with a, uh, yeah, with the antibody to the uh, to an antibody, <laughs> basically. So, because uh, you're looking for, let's say, IgG uh, in the serum of the patient, an IgG that would bind uh, HIV or HCV to see whether they're positive for antibodies. So, this antibody here would be an anti-IgG, and so if the uh, uh, patient's blood have antibodies to HIV, they would bind here. And then this detection antibody will bind to that IgG and uh, create a line a signal uh, that you would see visually on the test strip. If there are no IgGs that bind here, uh, they would just go over here and then cap be captured by this other anti uh, let's say anti-human IgG antibody, and then also be labeled with this antibody. And this is just to show that the test actually ran and uh, it's not invalid, okay? So that's the format. And this is where we actually did the work. So you have this uh, column that we use for purification and testing, quality control testing, and uh, test strips, what the test strips look like, uh, and the uh, lyophilized reagents that we use in our assays. Okay. Uh, now, on to in vitro transcription of RNA targets. So, um, our company, after another almost 10 years after that, uh, became uh, or went into um, doing nucleic acid-based testing. If you notice, our initial work was antigen antibody type tests, uh, lateral flow tests. Uh, actually, uh, DRW uh, turned its focus on uh, anti, anti uh, or nucleic acid-based testing. 
the format chosen is NASBA and the point of care test system is called SAMBA. Uh, since we are still looking at point of care uh, testing technologies that can be used you know, in Africa or anywhere, uh, we had to automate sample preparation. Uh, and in, in nucleic acid testing, you have to process your sample from let's say swabs or saliva or blood in our case, uh, in order to extract the RNA target and then do your amplification and detection. So uh, we did a lot of the new work in Europe uh, in Cambridge, but also we have a facility in here in the USA in San Jose uh, to do the uh, manufacturing. And uh, the platform, as I said, is Samba 2. It consists of an assay module and a tablet module. Uh, and these two communicate via Bluetooth. Uh, and the tablet module records sample uh, metadata and controls the assay module. It records the results of the test and send it out to a lab, laboratory information management system or LIMS to the Ministry of Health or to, uh, or to a remote clinic. Uh, it's capable of sending SMS or uh, 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 via the internet. And this assay module carries out sample preparation, target amplification and detection. So basically you put your blood sample in and the result will come out in the tablet after uh, a couple hours. So that's the system. And uh, in my lab here in San Jose, I have many of these assay modules uh, because I do uh, assay development and testing. Um, okay, of course I have the class two cabinet, so, and PCR, uh, Cabinets. So I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm already at 45 minutes. Uh, I should uh, stop here, but I will, I will describe to you the NASBA format that uh, our company is using because the next, my presentation tomorrow will refer to this uh, particular uh, system or format. So in NASBA, unlike in PCR, where you amplify double-stranded DNA by polymerase chain reaction, uh, and if you have RNA from SARS-CoV, you have to reverse transcribe it first to DNA before amplifying by PCR. NASBA amplifies the single-stranded RNA from, let's say, SARS-CoV or HIV directly into more RNA amplicons. And how is it doing that? Well. The uh, first step is binding of uh, primer one. Uh, the primer one features a T7 promoter sequence. Uh, you've seen T7 already, right? T7 is a, is a phage, but uh, basically we use uh, a T7 uh, reverse transcriptase a lot. So that's why, uh, and T7 polymerase, uh, I mean, T7 polymerase to uh, produce RNA. Uh, so we need the promoter there. Uh, and so that, that should be complementary because it's a primer to your target RNA. And then uh, the reverse transcriptase enzyme synthesizes a, a, um, a DNA strand uh, to that. By the way, uh, the primer is DNA, the target is RNA. So you get you get a uh, hybrid of RNA DNA here and RNA H comes in and digests the RNA. As I mentioned before, that's the function of RNAs. So now you have a single stranded DNA to which your reverse primer P2 binds and synthesizes another strand of the DNA. Now you have a double stranded DNA with a T7 promoter. So therefore T7 RNA polymerase comes in and makes, makes you a lot of RNA amplicons. Uh, but these amplicons don't sit there and wait for you to detect them because 
they can be a target for the, the same P2 promote, uh, primer here. And then the RT enzyme can make another DNA strand out of that and digest that RNA. And then by RNA states would digest the RNA. And then the P1 with a T7 goes in and gets uh, synthesized or extended. And now you have another double strand. So you get these two amplifications and you get lots of RNA amplicons that now you can detect. Okay, so that's the amplification of NASPA. I think I'm gonna end my presentation here. As you can see, I still have 86 slides or probably another 60 or 50 plus, but uh, I'll leave that for uh, tomorrow and take your questions. I'll stop sharing now, I think. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadala, for that uh, very informative discussion and, of course, in sharing your journey in research and uh, development. So I uh, would also like to apologize for some of the interruptions and technical difficulties we have experienced earlier. So you now, did? yes, sir. Oh, okay. I, yes, I sir. Didn't know. yes, sir. So um, uh, now let's proceed to our uh, Q&A uh, Q session. So. For our participants, so please key in your questions in our chat box in this Zoom meeting room. And then, of course, our audiences from our Facebook and YouTube live stream can also uh, type in their questions in the comment section so that the uh, moderators can pick them up and be addressed by Dr. Nadala. So uh, currently, uh, we have um, questions now from uh, our Zoom meeting room. So I'm seeing it now in our chat box. So... Uh, let me address first my namesake, yeah, it's Mr. Uh, Joven Patricio from Zoom. So do you have any idea how tetrasilver tetroxide can effectively treat AIDS? And the what? Silver? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, tet um, tetrasilver tetroxide. No, I haven't heard of that no. at all. Okay, sir. So um, our uh, next question is... Uh, from uh, Rainier Ulrich uh, Velasco. So, good morning. Would initial additional equipment be needed for the production of the rapid test strips? Thank you. Rapid test strip, uh, you would need something to line uh, your nitrocellulose strips uh, and then something to cut. Of course, some people just use a plotter or like a pen. Uh, very primitive, but these, these equipment are not expensive at all. Uh, I know a company in the East Coast that makes them for like uh, $15,000, I think. Um, and then a cutter, uh, essentially so that you can cut them into these five millimeter strips. Because you start off with a card about 30 centimeters long, and you basically uh, attach your nitrocellulose membrane uh, that you line with your capture antibodies uh, or antigen. And then you put on an absorbent pad and you put on a sample pad and a conjugate pad. So yes, there are only uh, two equip pieces of equipment. One that lines the membrane, the other that cuts the strips. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. So another question from our Zoom. Um, Hi, sir. May I ask if you have an experience in using a PQE expression system with T5 promoter? If so, uh, what E. coli strain can you recommend for protein expression? This was from Ms. Maria Ricci Gomez. No, I haven't experienced. I've all, only used uh, the PET system uh, uh, with a T7 promoter. Yeah. Uh, but, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, a lot of a lot of competent cells are available with various uh, modifications uh, that you might need. And uh, if you look at the um, the website for ever selling these uh, systems, you will see a lot of options. Uh, okay, so but I, I do recommend the PT system because uh, that's what I'm used to. And I've always been successful with them. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you. So we have another one from uh, Zoom. 
So from Mr. John Paul Ramos, uh, good afternoon po. Why was indirect ELISA chosen in the development of the assay for the detection of NPC instead of direct sandwich or competitive? Uh, well, I mean, sandwich, yeah, I mean, you can do sandwich, but uh, the thing is I have pure antigen, so uh, putting your antigen directly uh, on the plate allows you to selectively just capture whatever antibodies the patient has that recognizes their antigen. And all you have to do now is use an anti antibody that will select just IgA. Uh, in my case, I wanted to, to find IgA rather than IgG because IgG could come from exposure to uh, Epstein-Barr virus from a long time ago as a memory antibody. And I don't want that. I want IgA because it's a more uh, recent and uh, EBV is actually a kissing virus. So that means a lot of it is transmitted via saliva. Um, and IgA is abundant in saliva. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you. So I think we have another one from Mr. Patrick Espeleta again from our Zoom. So hi, sir. Uh, what is the difference between the two sets of RNA amplicon produced in NASBA based on your presentation? Thank you. Uh, they are the same. They, they are the same. Uh, it's just that the other one was was uh, is produced uh, from uh the uh the rna that was initially produced so you have two steps in the amplification and both of these feed on each other actually uh, so the first step is that's why nasba can make a lot more uh, rna than uh, pcr in a given period of time uh, because the amplification uh, happens in the two different phases. So there is an amplification of an amplicon, essentially, right? In, 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 uh, in PCR, um, you amplify and it doubles and doubles. Uh, but here, you generate a lot from one, one uh, template. You generate very many and this very many become also a template for a lot more. So it's, it's a more logarithmic kind of amplification. But uh, as to your question, they are both the same sense of RNA, okay? Because RNA has two sense, uh, the sense and antisense. And they're okay, the same. Uh, okay, the same. sir. Uh, thank you. So, uh, well, in the interest of time, so we'll be ending uh, our Q&A session now. So for those uh, questions that remains, so uh, don't worry because we'll be addressing these questions uh, for tomorrow's uh, Q&A session. So again, um, Dr. Nadala is also open in um, answering your questions uh, through email. So uh, we may uh, also accommodate uh, those questions from our participants. Uh, from our Zoom meeting uh, room and then from our uh, live streams in Facebook and YouTube. Okay, so uh, thank you again, Dr. Nadala. So before we end the first day of our uh, webinar, may I request everyone to open their cameras for a short group picture uh, taking. So um, sana po lahat po ng ating participants uh, makapag-open ng kanilang cameras uh, for our uh, group picture taking. So um, to our uh, technical group or Zoom moderator, so uh, please, ano na lang po, ano, um, assist me in uh, taking a screenshot of uh, the uh, participants uh, for today. So, yeah. So, for our uh, Zoom moderators po, from our uh, MIS, so, pa countdown na lang po. So, yan. Um, medyo marami-marami po tayo. 
One, two, three, smile. Next panel po. One, two, three, smile. Next four. One, two, three, smile. Next no po. Uh, next po, bali five out of nine na po. Eh, puta. Next po, six out of nine na po. Pa-open na lang po ng camera. Next po, next panel na po. Smile. Tumisilaot na ang ano, hudyat na ng pagpasok. Maglilingkod na wala ng eight out of nine na po. Sabayan ang aming hati. Tarana, kaibigan, wag kang magpaiwan. Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulo. Ating abot ay last na po ito. Ayan, so uh, maraming salamat po. Uh, so medyo sorry po, fake news po pala yung ating short uh, group picture taking since napakarami nga po ng ating participants for today. So that concludes the first day of our two-day webinar. So please be reminded that the evaluation form will be given tomorrow po after the second day discussion. So the evaluation form is required before you can secure a copy of the certificate and a copy of their presentations as well. So, sana po uh, makasama rin tayo sa ating second day of webinar with Dr. Nadala. So, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Nadala, Dr. Biones, all our uh, distinguished guests, and of course, all of our participants for today. So, see you tomorrow po. Ayan, so, uh, same Zoom link po, same Facebook page, and then same YouTube channel din po. Uh, this has been Joven Barcel of DOSTDI, uh, DOSTITDI. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy lunch po sa ating lahat. Thank you, Dr. Cesar. Salamat. <laughs> and the participants, thank you. Tumitilaot na ang manok, hudyat na ng pagpasok. Paglilingkod na walang kapalit Sa bayan ang aming hati Tara na, kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulo Ating abutin ang pangarap ni Juan Sa pamamagitan ng agham Ang kaunlaran ay magkakamtan Kung lahat
yun ay haharapin Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararating Tara na kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susunod At ikabutin ang pangarapiwan Sa pamamagitan na Sa pamamagitan na maghap, ang kaunlaran ay makakamtan. Kung lahat magtutulungan, tara na sama-sama, itaguyod ang siyensya. Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas. Pangarap kong magkaroon ng mabilis at murang transportasyon para sa lahat. Pangarap kong masagot ang malnutrition. Pangarap ko pong magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergency. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko pong maging scientist. Yung dao simula na Humanda sabay-sabay akyat Hawak kamay tayo'y ang ating lipat Lipat Ating nabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan ng aghag Ang kaunlaran ay makagamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Sa Pilipinas